Hello and welcome to the second in our virtual series of um, seminar papers with um, Edge Hill 19. It's um, delightful for me to be able to introduce you to Erin Lafford, a, a postdoctoral research fellow in English at the University of Derby. Um, she's working on her first monograph currently, John Clare and the Poetry of Illness, and she's going to talk more about John Clare um, this morning with us or whenever you're going to watch it. Um, Recently published in 2020, just like very recently, is Palgrave Advances in John Clare Studies, uh, co-edited with um, Simon Kaveshi, uh, and she's starting new research on uh, the wonderfully titled Contagious Picturesque, which I think sounds really fascinating, uh, thinking about um, the role of atmosphere in the works of uh, William Gilpin, which you can see some of the fruits of in a forthcoming special issue of uh, the journal Romanticism. Um, over to you, Erin. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my slide, my screen. So if I, oh, could you make me a co-host? Oh God. <laughs> yes, okay. back. Right, excellent. I'll just share my screen. Um, here we are. I confess that my slides are not as beautiful as the poster that Bob Nicholson designed um, for the event. Thank you so much for your lovely work. Um, okay, from beginning. Is that sharing for you, Andrew? Yeah, okay, fab. I'm just gonna um, jump straight into the paper then. Recalling his first feelings and attempts at poetry in his autobiographical fragments, John Clare describes how an act of carelessness very nearly stopped his writing career before it got started. Trying to find ways to write poetry um, covertly in a labouring class household and to save his own embarrassment at being discovered, Clare confesses to more than one harmless deception, as he calls it. One involved sliding his poems over a book as though I was reading it, he says, when reciting his work to his parents in order to seek their opinion without exposing himself as the author. The other deception was more risky. I hugged myself over this deception and often repeated it, and those which they praised as superior to others, I tried to preserve in a hole in the wall but my mother found out the herd and unconsciously took them for kettle holders and fire lighters whenever she wanted paper, not knowing that they were anything farther than attempts at learning to write. And I used to feel a little mortified after I discovered it, but I dare not reveal the secret by owning to it and wishing her to desist, for I feared if I did, she would have shown them to someone to judge of their value, which would have put me to shame. So I kept the secret disappointment to myself and wrote on, suffering her to destroy them as she pleased. But when I wrote anything which I imagined better than others, I preserved it in my pocket till the paper was chafed through and destroyed by a different and full as vain preservation. This reflection on his early writing habits tells us a lot about how Claire felt about the attention and attentiveness of others. Adam Phillips writes about Claire as a poet who both courted and resisted exposure, whose, quote, radical uncertainty about being a poet caused him and his verse to, quote, continually vacillate between the wish to be seen and published and genial and the wish to hide or withdraw or flee. Phillips is one of many who've recognized an affinity between Clare's discomfort with recognition and having his poems noticed by others and his frequent poetic depictions of animals and birds who are hunted or who risk having their protective shelters disturbed. To the snipe, especially as a study of a wetland bird who finds a fragile security in marshy flats away from man's dreaded sight, offers Claire what Mina Gorgi describes as the hiding place of poetry. What this passage from Claire's autobiographical fragment shows us is that hiding poems away wasn't always the best way to keep them safe. Caring so much about the anticipated criticisms or mockery of other readers means that Claire is willing to endure their carelessness meaning their lack of attention as well as their absent-minded destructions instead 
and even finds a degree of painful protection in it. The passage also shows how Claire's own attempts at self-preservation could become acts of carelessness in themselves or of misdirected care. Hiding his poems in a place that his mother returns to whenever she wanted paper for firelighters seems to ensure their destruction, as does keeping them preserved in his pockets for so long that the paper they're written on starts to disintegrate. This episode from Claire's early life finds an echo in a letter that he wrote to his publisher, John Taylor, sometime between 1822 and 1823. It says, I've sent you the whole of my rubbish, which I have scribbled lately. I think we can all sympathise with this feeling about work that we're unsure of when we submit it. They are not sent as good ones, but for you to think of as you please. I fancy them fit for nothing but the fire, and if you think the same, I shall not be disappointed. I am this day clear of the world and care for nobody, and be damned if I don't contrive to keep so for my own satisfaction as well as others. So here, Claire's um, earlier recollection is transformed into a more calculated form of defence. The young, unpublished poet who watched his mother burn his verses unknowingly in the fire now with two published volumes to his name, so poems descriptive of rural life and scenery had been published to great success in 1820 and the village minstrel had received a less warm reception in 1821. He casts off his verse as scribbled rubbish and fit for nothing but the fire before anyone else can do so. Claire's insistence that he shall not be disappointed if Taylor is unimpressed by his latest offerings betrays a latent insecurity and the nervousness of the scrutiny of his publisher that sits behind this insistence on having care for nobody. It's a strategy of detachment and deflection noticeable elsewhere in Clare's letters. So he writes to James Hesse, uh, John Taylor's publishing partner, again in 1822, um, which is below on the slide, um, saying that my mind has its ebbs and flows like the tide I wish I could be settled to something, but it seems impossible. Here is 14 lines, but whether good or bad, I know not and care as little. Carelessness, as I'll discuss over the course of this paper, has a manifold presence across Claire's writings in both his poetry and his prose. In the examples I've just discussed, carelessness registers as a kind of unconscious and um, absent-mindedness, uh, as a pretension towards quick, artless scribbling um, as a protective cover for underconfidence and a form of dejection of not caring for or about anyone or anything and of feeling uncared for. But it also has an effective pleasure for Claire. He is as much the poet who declares a love for careless rambles in a middle period sonnet as he is the poet who laments I am but what I am now cares or knows in perhaps his most well-known asylum lyric. So in many ways, thinking about Claire as a careless poet or a poet of carelessness is another way of trying to consider what many other readers and critics have found compelling about his work. That is this line that Claire treads being marketed as the Northamptonshire peasant poet um, between the artful and the authentic. Um, how he's at once invested in a form of poetry that is rough and hastily scribbled in snatches, but yet also um, very astutely aware of how such a kind of verse is fulfilling a market for self-taught labouring class poetry. If artless and also awkward are two terms um, conceived by the critic Mina Gorgi that have become central to how we read this paradoxical nature of Claire's verse, where his, uh, quote, metrical and linguistic shuffling and stumbling are not simply the signs of rustic incompetence, but instances of Claire's playing with readers' prejudices about a peasant poet, then careless could be added to these as a key aesthetic term to keep in mind. Indeed, writing about this thorny problem of classifying and making meaning out of apparent um, errors in Claire's verse, which is something that we all kind of have to grapple with as readers of him. Erica McAlpine has suggested in her recent book, The Poet's Mistake, that since Claire is a poet whose incorrectness also constitutes an effect 
we must tread extra carefully. Not all mistakes in his poetry are created equal. Some errors result from a poetical effort that includes or accounts for carelessness. And then McAlpine uh, also suggests that Claire's errors are overdetermined. They are liberal, stylish, purposeful and careless. So if um, such a, a recognition of the poetic effort that carelessness uh, kind of glosses over should make us alert to the significant level of craft that underlies all of Claire's verse, then I think it also has more to tell us about how he negotiates the limits of effective attachment in his work, as well as what, in conversation with uh, Daniel, Daniel M. Gross's idea in The Secret History of Emotion, I want to explore as the uneven um, distribution of emotion, which includes a wish to be unburdened by certain states of feeling. My interest in the um, effective dynamics of carelessness in Claire's work is guided by two um, emergent areas of inquiry. The first is the turn to what's called affective eco-criticism, as exemplified by the recent edited collection by Kyle uh, Bladau and Jennifer Ladino, and by Alexa Weich von Mosner's book, Effective Ecologies where even though um, a variety of effects and emotions are explored for how they shape and mediate our relationship to non-human nature, um, there remains a key emphasis on asking how, as Mosner does, um, how do environmental narratives invite us to care for human and non-human others who are put at risk? That's a quote from Mosner there. And then the second area is the rise of interest in dispassion and sort of negated affect within literary studies. So I'm thinking here not only of Eric Gray's The Poetry of Indifference from 2005, where he argues that there's running a, a kind of against an overtly romantic poetics of sympathy and kind of strong emotion, um, a countercurrent of indifference that offers, quote, a way of avoiding issues of deep human concern. But also more recently, I'm thinking of Wendy Ann Lee's Failures of Feeling, Insensibility and the Novel um, from 2019, where among other things, she revisits the life of the passions and sympathy in the 18th century novel in order to suggest that as much of their narrative work and um, how they explore interior life, um, thinking about the construction of indifference in Samuel Richardson's Clarissa, for example, um, is organised around moments of insensibility and its provocations, as much as it is around overt displays of um, and exhortations of sympathetic feeling. The insensible figure is the overlooked, um, unmoved mover, as Lee says, of 18th century fiction and its afterlives. And I'm also thinking of David Carroll Simon's recent book, Light Without Heat, The Observational Mood from Bacon to Milton from 2018, where in the context of the 17th century um, scientific imagination, he proposes what he calls mental laxity as a counter to assertions of stringency in scientific investigation in order to explore the sensory and the mental perceptions that are, quote, enabled or intensified by casual indifference and by embracing an experience of carelessness. So keeping in mind both the call towards environmental and social care, and the question of what um, role literature plays in that call, and the literary and the effective possibilities and freedoms of carelessness, I want broadly to ask that if Claire's poetry bestows care or a caring attention in some way, then what does this care look like and what form does it take? And is it possible to perhaps find a conversation going on in his poetry and prose between carelessness as this desirable effective freedom from care and worry, as well as a form of inattention, and then with the social and ecological consequences of not caring? There is a um, persistent narrative surrounding Claire that he was a poet who fostered but also suffered from a form of over-attachment to his local surroundings in Helpston in Peterborough. And indeed that it was his three mile move to Northborough in, 18, in 1832 that um, unsettled um, his already erratic mental and physical health to the irreparable degree that it required his admission to High Beach Asylum in Epping Forest in 1837. 
The move to Northborough as this kind of tipping point has acquired an almost mythological status in biographical narratives of Clare's life. His first biographer, Frederick Martin, for example, who describes in a very dramatic way Clare's admission to High Beach as him walking mechanically with his eyes half shut as in a dream, uh, presented this event as the unhappy consequence of an intense kind of local attachment and its disruption. Reflecting on Clare's life and helps them before the move, Martin wrote, here he knew every shrub and every inch of ground and through many years converse with nature had come to look upon the most minute objects with intense feelings of love. In the introduction to the volume of Clare's poems that he edited in 1908, uh, Arthur Simmons also painted Clare's well-being as dependent on this intense attachment to a specific place. He says he could not endure anything that he had once known should be changed. He kept his reason as long as he was left to starve and suffer in that hut. And when he was taken from it, though to a better dwelling, he lost all hold on himself. He was torn up by the roots and the flower of his mind withered. What this transplanting did for him is enough to show how native to him was his own soil and how his songs grew out of it. So although we might perhaps uh, maybe roll our eyes at this image of Claire as a kind of tragically uprooted plant um, and sort of sense uh, a degree of condescension or a kind of negation of Claire's agency as someone who's just taken from an environment that he's dependent on with no consent. Um, Claire did himself confess quite self-consciously to feelings of over-attachment to the places and environments that he knew intimately. In a letter to John Taylor in 1821, he wrote, was people ought to feel and think as I do, the world could not be carried on. A green would not be ploughed, a tree or bush would not be cut for firing or furniture, and everything they found when boys would remain in that state till they died. This is my indisposition. Claire's indisposition, by his own admission, is that he cares too much about too many things. If this is perhaps a glib way of putting it, there is, I think, here quite a shrewd assessment of a supposed um, imbalance in his affective attachments and in where he directs his caring attention. What is often received as a kind of proto-ecological um, concern for the emotional importance of the local and one's familiar everyday uh, non-human encounters, expressed in poems such as To a Fallen Elm, for example, where Claire mourns the loss of an old favourite tree as a friendship that has been um, betrayed, he says. It also it's also acknowledged as an emotional disposition that sometimes is experienced as incapacitating, or at least not sustainable on a scale beyond uh, just Claire's singular affective um, eccentricities. A need to care about and also account for everything has been received as both a weakness and a strength when it comes to Claire's poetic style. So I was reminded last week by Michael Nicholson in a paper that he was giving on Claire and the notion of poetic distress of um, John Barrell's suggestion in the idea of landscape and the sense of place that Claire's verse creates, quote, the sense always that outside the poem are hundreds of images hammering to be admitted. Whereas Barrel is seeking to kind of showcase Claire's um, divergence um, from the traditions of 18th century topographical poetry, uh, John Middleton Murray, in a much earlier essay from 1921, uh, was less sympathetic towards an apparent lack of um, selection in Claire's verse. Um, quoting now, Claire's difficulty as a poet, he suggested, was that he did not know when to stop. Comparing his poem Autumn to Collins' famous ode, um, Murray claims that Collins, uh, this is a quote, gathers up all his more exiguous, uh, meaning small or minute, perceptions into a single stimulus to emotion. Claire lets them fall one by one, careless of his amazing jewels. Here, um, an aesthetic that seeks to attend to everything signals as a carelessness with one's emotional clarity and control not as a, perhaps an expansive capacity to care that tries to gather every green tree and bush together and to keep them safe. John Ashbury, um, the American poet, um, his prose poem, For John Clare, 
reads as a kind of breathless tribute to Claire's seeming overattention um, of this needing to pay things their due notice and care. So he says here, there ought to be room for more things, for a spreading out like, being immersed in the details of rock and field and slope, letting them come to you for once and then meeting them halfway would be so much easier. And then later in the poem he says, waiting for something to be over before you are forced to notice it. And Stephanie Kudrick Reiner has discussed at length in her book, Claire's Lyric, uh, John Ashbury's many debts to Claire as a poet who's always trying to kind of notice and take care of everything. If Claire has this reputation then for a kind of difficult gift of over-attentiveness, then we should also remember that he's often a poet of ease. So here is a sonnet from his middle period titled A, a Hawthorne Nook. This poem was part of Claire's large manuscript for his proposed volume, The Midsummer Cushion, which eventually appeared um, very heavily edited and with lots of poems cut out from it, um, as his last published volume, The Rural Muse in 1835. Uh, and this sonnet wasn't included in the published version. I'll just read the full poem. The smooth and velvet sward my fancy suits in pleasant places where the hawthorns look as left for arbors and the old tree roots lie cramped and netted o'er the guggling brook and shepherd on his elbow lolls to read his slips of ballads bought at neighboring fair seeming unconscious of the beauties there the stilly quiet of the grassy screed skirting the busy brook the happy fair of little birds that in the bushes breed are all unnoticed save that careless way that sees and feels not there I love to pass the green hour's leisure of a summer's day, stretching at length upon the couching grass. So our knowledge of Claire as a labouring class poet who is working as a thresher, a hedger, a gardener, a lime burner, among other things, um, is enough to help us see that moments um, such as this of pastoral ease and retreat are frequently uh, momentary in his verse. It's a green hour's leisure that's been snatched uh, during breaks from labour, if not an expression of a desire for a stretching freedom that isn't, is never otherwise um, sort of forthcoming. But what I'm interested in here is how a relief from effort gives way to a new form of attention, or rather a productive form of inattention. So I think it's fascinating how a sonnet that luxuriates in indolence and neglect can also feel so busy it's at once harnessing the slow pleasure of lolling and stretching and also cramped, to use Claire's word, um, full with lots of fleeting visual impressions. Claire does not frame this openness to the impressions of the scene as a, as a kind of anxious overattention, but as that careless way that seals, sees and feels not. So this doesn't read as the inability to control one's own emotional stimulus that Murray suggested is producing Claire's haphazard excessive style, but rather as a quite cool and dispassionate way of approaching one's object that allows it um, to draw on Ashbury's prose poem, perhaps to, to come to you or to meet you halfway. There is quite a fruitful freedom in not getting attached here which importantly is being contrasted against a different species of inattention that's also present in the poem. So this shepherd who on his elbow lolls to read his slips of ballads bought at neighboring fair is too idly absorbed in his leisure. And so um, to the subject in the poem at least appears unconscious of the beauty that surrounds him. What saves these beauties from going completely unnoticed and so ensures that the poem exists is this alternative careless way that is free and open to whatever might just pass its attention. So I think if we remain as interested in Claire's poems of leisure as um, indexes of his disposition towards the environment, as we do in his, his, um, his cries against injustice um, or degradation, so such as the grief into a fallen elm or the despair and exhortation in the lament of Saudi well, or even sort of the brutality of the badger, for example, poems that might more overtly kind of court our care and sympathy or kind of shock us into paying attention, then we can see how negligence itself might become a form of care for Claire too, in that it offers a way of looking that wishes to kind of let things be and to exist 
on their own terms. His sonnet, um, Pleasant Spots, for example, which is also part of the manuscript for the Midsummer Cushion, celebrates um, a wild and beautiful neglect about the fields that so delights and cheers, where nature her own feelings to affect is left at her own silent work for years. The simplest thing thrown in our way delights from the wild careless feature that it wears, the very road that wanders out of sight, crooked and free is pleasant to behold, and such the very weeds left free to flower, corn poppies red and carlock gleaming gold, that make the cornfield shine in summer's hours, like painted skies, and fancy's distant eye may well imagine armies marching by, in all the grand array of pomp and power. So if Claire's um, delight in, uh, in wild and beautiful neglect in this sonnet, um, might signal to the influence of the picturesque on his vision of the natural world, as um, Timothy Brownlow has argued for in his very detailed study, uh, John Clare and Picturesque Landscape. Um, he's, Clare is also forging his own form of careless uh, disinterest that is less about the kind of proportions of landscape painting and more about an openness to haphazard and unpredictable encounter, to things thrown in our way that we weren't expecting to notice and that in themselves are kind of careless of one's attention. In April 1823, uh, Henry Francis Carey wrote to Clare expressing um, playful astonishment at um, his local landscape and his local surroundings. He says, you must surely have something better than fenny flats about you, or else where do all the live things come from that get into your verses? And this suggestion that Clare's poetry is animated by live things that get into his verse is more suggestive of kind of surreptitious breaches than of selective um, decisive craft, as though his environment sort of has a life of its own and works its way into his poetry while his attention is diverted elsewhere. Clare was very sensitive to himself as a poet of uh, trespass, as John Goodridge and Kelsey Thornton have argued. Um, of sneaking in where he shouldn't be, both in the context of enclosure and the literary marketplace. He remarked to Alan Cunningham in a letter of 1824 that they, along with James Hogg, um, the Ettrick Shepherd, were, quote, stray cattle in the fields of the muses. Whilst this reveals um, perhaps an uncomfortable self-consciousness of his class, it also speaks to Claire's, <coughs> excuse me, poetic interest in other stray creatures that energize his verse by getting into it. So take this passage from uh, January, A Winter's Day, which is from the shepherd's calendar, for example. The robin that with nimble eye, glegs, uh, glegs is a um, North Hampshire dialect word for glances. So the robin that with nimble eye, glegs round a danger to a spy, now pops from out the open door from crumbs half left upon the floor nor wipes his bill on perching chair, nor stays to clean a feather there, scared at the cat that sliveth in, a chance from evening's glooms to win, to jump on chairs or tables nigh, eking what plunder may supply, the children's littered scraps to thieve, or aught that negligence may leave, creeping when housewives cease to watch, or dairy doors are off the latch. <clears throat> So here in this passage, negligence and carelessness are also revealed to be invitations to other stolen forms of care and sustenance. The robin and the cat are both kind of figured as these chances that win when the human agents in the poem cease to watch. And I think as a poet who was very keenly aware of want and need among his kind of human labouring class community, and of a fallible system of parish relief and support, um, Claire seems to sympathise with non-human acts of scavenging and also knows the worth of um, kind of alternative ecologies of care that don't just account for negligence but work with um, its inattentiveness in order to provide um, sort of resources. Claire liked to compare his capacity for careful watching to others who he considered lacked his taste for detail and for noticing the extraordinary in the ordinary, even if his recognition of his difference sometimes caused feelings of alienation. 
so recalling his interactions with other school children in his autobiographical prose, he remembers how, when I happened with them in my Sunday walks, I often tried their taste by pointing out some beauty in a wild flower or object in the surrounding scenery to which they would seldom make an answer. Turning careless to reassume their old discourse and laughing at my droll fancies as they would call them. I often wondered that while I was peeping about and finding such quantities of pleasing things to stop and pause over, another should pass me as careless as if he was blind. So as much as he um, is kind of bruised by this careless inattention of other children that sort of show his oddity, um, at the same time, the adult Claire often admired others for their ability to present an impression of carelessness to their audience. During his first visit to London in 1820, so the same year that Claire's being sort of launched into the literary scene with the publication of um, Poems Descriptive, he was a guest at uh, sort of dinner parties that are being held by John Taylor, his publisher, um, and that included the company of Charles Lamb, William Hazlitt, uh, and John Hamilton Reynolds, amongst others. Although narratives of Clare's kind of bewilderment and anxiety um, in London have uh, quite importantly been countered by critics like Simon Kaveshi, who shows Clare to be, in fact, an immensely kind of clubbable poet who enjoyed the opportunity to network in his publisher's circle. Um, Claire's studies of these literary figures in his prose um, reveals also a fascination with their sort of metropolitan confidence um, that hints at a sense of his own shortcomings by comparison. So here is a descriptive sketch of Reynolds first. It says nothing could put him out of humour either with himself or others. If all his jokes and puns and witticisms were written down, which were uttered at two or three of these dinner parties, they would make one of the best Joe Millers that have ever passed under that title. He sits as a careless listener at table, looking on with quick, naping sort of eye that turns towards you as quick as lightning when he has a pun, joke or story to give you. They are never made up or studied. They are the flashes of the moment and mostly happy. And then below here we have his description of Charles Lamb. He says, who is not acquainted with Elia, which was uh, Charles Lamb's pseudonym that he published under, and who would believe him otherwise as soon as the cloth is drawn the wine and he's become comfortable, his talk now doubles and trebles into a combination of repetitions, urging the same thing over and over again, till at last he leans off with scarcely good nights in his mouth. There is his sister Bridget, a good sort of woman, though her kind cautions and tender admonitions are nearly lost upon Charles, Charles, who like an undermined riverbank leans carelessly over his jollity and receives the gentle lappings of the waves of woman's tongue unheedingly till it ebbs and then in the same careless posture sits and receives it again, though it is all lost on Charles. So both of these sketches in their um, sort of quite slightly bewildered admiration of um, a careless posture and quick um, unstudied wit, um, I think speak to what is also at stake in Claire's preference for a careless way of seeing the natural world and taking delight in its wild careless feature. They're modeling an effective freedom from care as a kind of burden of mental and emotional worry or, or suffering and a way of turning out sort of mostly happy thoughts um, that he yearns for, but consistently also sort of struggles against. Our happy songster man can seldom share a spot as hidden from the haunts of care, he declares to the reed bird at the end of his sonnet at the same name, um, expressing a longing for freedom from kind of mental and emotional care, as well as perhaps from um, his caring attachments picking up on that dual sense of care as both a heavy kind of burdensome emotion and as an attentive act. This longing could be attributed to Claire's sense of his own singular indisposition or kind of awkwardness to use Gorgie's term, but it also, I think, uh, gestures to his recognition that care is unevenly distributed in multiple senses. Some people endure more care in a way that's related to the fact that they receive sort of less care, less caring acts. So let's look, for example, at his sonnet, um, An Idle Hour, that's also in the manuscript for The Midsummer Cushion. 
says sauntering at ease I love to I often love to lean o'er old bridge walls and mark the flood below whose ripples through the weeds of oily green like happy travellers mutter as they go and mark the sunshine dancing on the arch time keeping to the merry waves beneath and on the banks see drooping blossoms parch thirsting for water in the day's hot breath right glad of mud drops plashed upon their leaves by cattle plunging from the steepy brink, while water flowers more than their share receive and revel to their very cups in drink, just like the world some strive and fare but ill, while others riot and have plenty still. So this sonnet, um, I think it opens simply enough um, in this register of kind of careless ease that Claire um, prefers in poems like uh, An Awthorn Nook and Pleasant Spots that we've already looked at. It's adopting this kind of indifferent mental um, laxity to draw on David Carroll Simon's term um, that sort of allows the subject to just lazily uh, mark the details of the scene as they float um, before him, the reeds, the ripples, um, the flowers on the riverbank. As the sonnet progresses, however, <clears throat> this careless disposition brings to the surface a more uncomfortable recognition of inequity and uneven distribution. And it's Claire's effective control, um, this kind of maintenance just of dispassionate noticing that is really masterly in this poem, I think, in that he allows the haphazard spattering of mud drops and their quenching effect on whatever surrounding vegetation they land on to become a powerful moral observation about an unequal distribution of care amongst human and non-human alike, but all whilst maintaining a surface carelessness that suggests this is just the sort of random state of things as they appear. That he achieves this observation not via a kind of sentimental set piece that um, ventriloquizes distress, but via this dispassionate register of careless detachment highlights powerfully the disparity between the light's indifferent ease that Claire is striving towards and then the effective and material burdens that are always pulling against it. In the introduction to the recently published um, The Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence, uh, the authors, um, Andreas uh, Chatsidakis, Jamie Hakim, Joe Littler, Catherine Rottenberg and Lynn Segal, um, state that our world is one in which carelessness reigns, that's a quote. As a kind of neoliberal condition, this uh, crisis of care, as they have it, um, takes the form of, quote, an organised neglect, whereby market logic has dismantled uh, infrastructures and economies of care and continues to undermine caring acts, capacities and forms of care work. There is an important and an impressive body of scholarship that has approached something like organised neglect in Claire's work at a level of form and craft. So I come back here to this kind of influential characterization of Claire as an artfully artless poet by Mina Gorgi here in particular. And without wanting to insist on parallels between the exhaustion of care in late stage capitalism laid out in the Care Manifesto and Claire's preoccupation with carelessness as an aesthetic technique, and as in a way to explore the effective burden of care. What I hope that I've moved towards in this paper is a way um, too of asking how stylistic and effective um, pretensions towards carelessness in Claire's verse can also become an index of his recognition of this other form of organized neglect as he saw it unfolding in his human and um, non-human community. That's me, that's me done. give you a round of applause I think I've popped back in yes <laughs> stop sh if you stop sharing the screen we'll pop back into the oh yeah uh stop yeah mm. okay I'm gonna give you a round of applause and invite you to take a bow mainly because I want the audience to see your oh dance. yeah there you go well I know you're studying animals this week so I thought it better be <laughs> the cat dog jumper That's a it should have been a bird or something but <laughs> Look at that. No, the, the, the dog and the cat is perfect. Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, that was a, a wonderful, um, rich paper um, with really um, generous um, quotations from, from the poetry and, and prose of John Clare and a lovely 
um, model for how to do a, a literature review on effective um, ecologies and the like. And I'm sure a lot for us to discuss next week when we um, we, re, 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 we reconvene to, to, to yeah. chat over a question and answer session. With yeah, you. I look forward to it and to, to have more time to think about my what I think <laughs> before we chat. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I will stop recording. Okay. We'll be okay.